Thank you, Cassia, and good morning, everybody, and um, welcome once again to Hazy Kuala Lumpur. I hope you're all not suffering too much uh, and staying indoors. Okay, and I've been asked to uh, speak to the issue around the tension of the current drug control regime and, and harm reduction. Uh, before I do that, I thought um, it, was, um, it would be prudent to review the human cost, as uh, uh, Ruth said in her opening statement of the current war on drugs, and to take a look at um, kind of the devastation that's uh, taking place in Mexico um, with the war on drug that's happening over there. And uh, as you can see here, uh, since it was leashed, there have been um, more than 150,000 Mexicans killed uh, in the crossfires between the uh, military and, and the drug cartels in Mexico, much more than the number of civilian deaths in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq put together. Closer to home, of course, uh, in 2003, we had um, the, the war on drugs that killed in just three months uh, approximately 2,800 people in, in extrajudicial killings in Thailand. And, of course, I think uh, many countries in Asia, including my own, including Malaysia, still subscribe to the death penalty for drug trafficking, often for very, very um, small amounts uh, of drugs. Now on to harm reduction. I think three decades after the, uh, uh, three decades since the HIV epidemic, the, um, the evidence around uh, the effectiveness of the needle syringe program and opiate substitution therapy, the two core interventions in uh, HIV prevention amongst people who use drugs, uh, it's no longer, no longer can be disputed, of course. But the uh, progress in implementing harm reduction has been slow. 77 countries uh, in 2008 had needle syringe program and that uh, six years later has uh, increased only to 90. With opiate substitution therapy, uh, we have 63 countries in 2008 and in 2014 only 80 countries uh, have implemented uh, OSD and of course there are many countries in um, the former Soviet Union and Central and uh, Asia that um, still are not able, as you heard, uh, to implement OSD. And why is this so? Um, this UNAIDS uh, GAP report that was published last year uh, clearly states that one of the top four reasons why people who inject drugs in the context of the HIV epidemic are being left behind is the number one the number one reason is the criminalization and punitive laws. The absence of inadequate prevention services, the widespread societal stigma, and, and, and the lack of investment. In my mind, number two, three, and four are pretty much related to number one um, since the, the uh, existence of the criminalization and punitive laws, I think, um, uh, directly or indirectly result in two, three, and four. So uh, the report further went to state that um, between 56 to 90 percent of people who inject drugs will be incarcerated at some stage in their lives. The majority of uh, national drug control policies on supply reduction and law enforcement uh, against any drug use and people who use drugs are often collateral victims of those interventions. And in various parts of the world, the possession of clean syringes uh, become evidence for police harassment, thereby deterring safe injecting practices. And in, particularly in this region, compulsory detention centers and prisons um, have become commonplace. So in Malaysia, um, with the uh, uh, expansion of the HIV epidemic in the early 2000s, and the failure to um, achieve the Millennium Development Goals, much to, um, sorry, against uh, public opinion and, and much controversy, uh, the Malaysian government at the time uh, gave the go ahead to implement needle syringe program and uh, opiate substitution therapy. And to date, we've had more than 85,000 people access a needle syringe program, mostly through partners. Um, 
of the Malaysian AIDS Council, uh, whereas the opiate substitution therapy is implemented by um, the Ministry of Health and, as well as uh, private practitioners. And to date, we've had close to 75,000 people uh, at any point uh, receive um, OST. And this has led to a remarkable uh, decrease in, as you heard uh, in the opening ceremony as well, in um, the number of new uh, reported cases of HIV that's uh, amongst people who use drugs. Carl said, with, with any uh, new programs, we must evaluate, we must evaluate the cost effectiveness, we must evaluate the benefits. And, and we did just that. We evaluated because um, uh, although there was uh, acceptance um, within the government and, and to a certain extent within, uh, with the public, I think um, given the laws that we have here in Malaysia, both the uh, needle syringe program and the op opiate substitution therapy, I think, um, uh, operates under a cloud of, uh, of yeah, well, um, not so much suspicion, but um, it's, it's not fully um, uh, sanctioned, I guess, uh, given the laws that we have. So we evaluated the programs, and what it showed was um, from the time that it was implemented in 2006 to 2013, um, it was estimated that about 14,000 new HIV infections were averted, and if you projected that into 2050 at the current coverage uh, of both the current rates of coverage of both the needle syringe and the opiate substitution therapy, uh, we would have averted 100, uh, more than 100,000, we will, we will avert more than 100,000 new infections projecting uh, forward into 2050 at a relatively low coverage that we uh, have. And this would have uh, saved the Malaysian government 47 million ringgit uh, in current terms, which is, you know, the Malaysian ringgit has really plummeted in the last uh, six months or so. It's probably about um, uh, 10 million US dollars in, in the, in the um, between 2006 and 2013, 200, 209 ringgit projecting forward to 2023 and 2050 to about um, 100 million ringgit. So you would have thought with um, uh, the evidence that uh, not only um, was it saving lives, but it was also, um, but it has also saved the government money that uh, we would see some action in terms of uh, new drug policies, but given these laws that we have, uh, we, we're still fighting a, a very tough battle. So we have the Dangerous Drug Acts in, from 1952, where um, there's mandatory death penalty for drugs, for, for uh, possession of drugs of more than 200 grams of cannabis or more than 15 grams of heroin. Um, there's compulsory rehabilitation and supervision orders even once you've been released from uh, the compulsory detention centers and, and so forth and so forth. We kind of saw a bit of light um, in 2010 when the National Drugs Agency decided to then transform the compulsory detention centers. We had in 2010 about 28 of these centers with around 15,000 people um, detained in the centers. So um, we had a, a, a very progressive uh, director general of the National Drugs Agencies who saw the evidence, who saw the impact that the community-based uh, uh, opiate substitution therapy that was um, being uh, implemented by the Ministry of Health and private practitioners had on the lives of people who use drugs. And so she uh, decided to and, and the National Drugs Agency decided to transform these uh, detention centers back in 2010 and very quickly um, uh, transform uh, about, I think, into 17 um, cure and care uh, clinics around the country. And we did a quick uh, evaluation of some of these uh, clients who were attending the cure and care centers. Um, uh, 313 people were interviewed back in 2013, and as you can see there, um, the very positive outcomes that uh, the clients shared with us in terms of their, their uh, attending um, the, the curing care centers. We then felt that we needed to do a uh, 
uh, a comparison between um, the compulsory detention centers and the um, cure and care clinics. So we embarked on a longitudinal observational study between the two groups. One was uh, a one-year follow-up post-release from the detention center and at the time of uh, enrolling in the cure and care clinics. And what we found was no surprise. I think we all knew even before um, this uh, formal study was done that the rates of relapse uh, upon release from the cure and care center, from the uh, from the compulsory detention centers um, uh, was very high. And as you can see here, the, the, the Kaplan-Meier separation leaves us no doubt as to which of the uh, treatment of the um, treatment model um, is preferable. Or in this uh, lovely infogram from David Wilson from the World Bank, uh, as you can see, com community opiate substitution therapy as uh, met as um, as shown by the CNC, the cure and care arm was six times more effective and 12 times more cost, and from the previous study, 12 times more cost effective as detention. However, as I showed you, there's a, there's a prologue to, to this. Is, is it prologue or epilogue? Prologue, isn't it? Epilogue. Um, given that the drug laws that I just showed you um, still exist and haven't been changed, and the uh, the unwritten drug policy that we have uh, remain unchanged. Many of you in the room know that the cure and care clinic that was, um, uh, that was impl implemented in 2010 up to about 2012, 2013, which was uh, voluntary um, and had a very comprehensive um, treatment, including psychosocial support, etc., probably is a shadow of itself uh, right now. So I think this is a, a real example of uh, the tension that can exist if um, current laws and policies remain as they are despite the good intentions um, that people uh, you know, uh, implementing these programs have in um, providing better evidence-based uh, treatment programs for people using drugs. So, it leaves, us, it leaves me actually no doubt in, in the need for um, uh, you know, the, not just national but global reform um, in, in drug policies and laws as I have witnessed uh, here myself. I mean, despite the, the so-called success of the harm reduction program, we're still forever two steps forward and one step back unless we um, align the uh, public health uh, initiatives with that of, um, of criminal justice. I just want to leave with these words uh, from Richard Horton and Pam Das uh, in the uh, editorial of the special series on HIV and people who use drugs that was published in 2010 in The Lancet. Um, we want to see inappropriately aggressive state-sponsored hostility to drug users replaced by enlightened scientifically driven attitudes and more equitable societal responses. We recognize the barriers to these hopes are many and deeply rooted across continents and cultures, but we also know that science can catalyze unprecedented social change. And social change is what is needed for millions of marginalized people infected with HIV and use drugs, who use drugs. I also want to leave you, in 2006 when I uh, did my plenary in, in Mexico, I shared with you this, uh, this video of a, of a Malaysian <coughs> drug user who I think um, has now passed on. And, um, it's um, a real reminder. I get very emotional when I'm tired and have not had enough sleep um, of the human costs of, of, um, of drug use. Paris, Paris. Oui, ibu tengok anak tu tak boleh cakap sama dia. Doa semayang, minta doa sihat dia jangan buat lagi. Ha, buat apa kata orang, kehidupan baru ya nak. Ha, tu macam doakan dia. Lepas lepas semayang. Cukup sayang dengan dia. Tengok dia tu. 
tengok orang-orang macam dia kesian ni. I have to my family. I have to my close friends about things like, you know, because I always fail when I stop. I want to stop, I always fail. So I told them, sometimes when I'm sick, even if you put my mom, my wife, my children, and you put a straw there, a tube, while I'm sick, not while I'm well. While I'm sick, okay, if you ask me to choose now, choose either one, I will still take my medicine first, I will still take the heroin first. All the time I try to stop, I fail. I never give, want to give up. Each time I fail, I look for the next. It's about 30 hours now since I had my last heroin. It's a long time. Yeah, it's a long time. Very long time. More than that now, I guess. About a day and a half now. People say that it's impossible for somebody like you to give up. I don't believe. <laughs> they say that. I don't, I don't want to take it. They say it's... it's Especially these people who say that are not the people who are sick. They are not the junkies. They are they are normal people. Of course, everybody wants to lead a better life. But I just want to live. I don't want to be a junkie all my life. I want to live. Thank you, Adiba. We'll ask Madi to take the stage now. Thanks. <laughs> 